All right, thank you very much. <clears throat> so our project with codename MATE C, Metaprotein Assembly for Therapeutic Engineering, Carbon Capture, etc., relies on the following motivation. So what is our common goal here is to arrange precisely things in 3D, right? And we have heard multiple approaches how to achieve it. We also feel that our approach is complementary to this, but it is very much inspired by nature, and it's much easier to start with 1D assembly and then go 3D from there. Our inspiration comes from a toy, the Rubik's snake, where you have different blockchain blocks, which we now we, we have to include all the buzzwords from Silicon Valley. So this is our 1D blockchain with individual blocks that are functionalizable, to which you can attach different materials. In our case, we are thinking about proteins. And you will have programmable joints. Each joint can be programmably addressed to be bent in a specific angle which it will hold after you impose that orientation. Our material to manufacture this programmable, uh, this programmable backbone will be DNA, and we will be attaching different proteins for therapeutic applications and assembling heterogeneous complexes. And I will let my colleague, expert on DNA, Carlos, to walk you through the mechanism of assembling these things. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the basic building blocks for the system. Uh, one is, you know, really, as Peter mentioned, based on the backbone, on this reconfigurable uh, backbone that can achieve, you know, change from a 1D conformation, a 1D straight line conformation or polymer conformation to some kind of higher order three-dimensional structure to position proteins in space. I think one advantage of this approach is it does take advantage of existing technologies, things that are currently possible. Uh, at least at a certain appropriate size scale with DNA origami. Um, so this is the schematic. I credit Julian for some really nice schematics. Um, but the idea would be you have this kind of multi-jointed chain uh, where, again, you can, you can basically programmably bend joints in a specific direction and to a specific angle. Um, and uh, on the right, you see just some examples, right? This was our inspiration and some examples that I think this is a realizable thing. This is one nice example that shows a three-arm chain. Each of those arms are about 50 nanometers, but we envisioned that these could be reduced to about 20 nanometers maybe to manipulate about 10 to 15 to 20 nanometer size proteins. And I would just add to it that it is complementary to the idea of 1D printer because you can also imagine functionalizing this uh, backbone strand with a slider which you can position in a specific position and either attach protein in that position or modify the given protein. And now for the next slide. Just, I'll, I'll talk about this one quickly too. So the other uh, main feature that we need is you know, docking proteins, right? And so this is, again, just leveraging established technologies. Uh, there are well-established ways to attach DNA strands to proteins using click chemistry or other conjugation chemistries. Uh, but then you can leverage the sequence specificity of the DNA base pairing to position these proteins at specific sites on the template, which is really the key step is that addressability of the DNA base pairing. Uh, and these, and then the other last piece is the actuation, which again is a well-established approach in uh, DNA origami uh, to either open and close things or even, you know, these other examples show things where you can hold things at pretty specific angles. It also is reconfigurable, so you can introduce the strand as the input which specifically bends given joint at given angle. But you can also introduce a strand which removes that strand, so you can unfold it again if you wish. And then you could introduce strands in sequence if you wanted to sort of sequentially fold up different parts to control the order of assembly as well. So now for the great applications, this is the killer app for this mechanism. All right, so in terms of application, we got slightly scooped by uh, William Shi, I guess. <laughs> um, but um, so one idea we had, so like essentially with that method, we can essentially assemble in three dimension like complex molecular assemblies. And so one clear application that we thought about is to make you know better vaccines. And so so right now we can design such like nano protein nano cages as you can see there, and then we can pattern antigens in a symmetric fashion that resemble viruses. And so that works pretty well, and we have actually vaccines in the clinic now. Uh, the one thing is that because of the symmetry of the particle, you can only pattern you know one antigen or two, and so. Uh, and so, so yeah, and then you can of course like make different particles, but they all present, for example, here like you know different antigens uh, into uh, different particles. And so what we, we can do essentially is break the symmetry with that method um, and pattern 
uh, antigens in an asymmetric way. And so that's very useful because then you can activate immune cells much more efficiently um, and also like decorate these particles of different antigens. So you can make much better vaccines. And so, so for example, here you can, so that's like a typical like acosahedra, acosahedron, acosahedral symmetry. Uh, and so, so here you can, uh, for example, here presents 12 different proteins in this symmetric particle. And because you break the symmetry, then you can kind of have like, like a presentation type that, that you can, uh, you know, design rationally. Um, okay, and then another application that, that we thought about, uh, I think it's something also that William she described is this idea of like making uh, de novo organelles and that can be very useful for catalysis. Uh, so in nature, there is this absolutely incredible organelle that's called a carboxysome, and that's responsible for carbon fixation. Um, and it's extremely interesting because it's a, it's a system that self-assembles. It's a very complicated, intricate ways of self-assembling, but essentially you have to pattern these, these enzymes in 3D um, uh, very precisely. And, uh, and then you can get, you know, like um, enhanced uh, catalytic activity and carbon fixation. And so that's something that we think we could, uh, we could potentially um, target with this approach. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I think one thing we talked about oh, thank you, on this workshop is the vision of uh, sitting down on a computer, designing your molecule to a specification, and then making it, and it does what you want. Uh, but the problem is for a lot of applications, we don't know the specifications. We shouldn't try to make one molecule. So uh, what we're interested in is uh, drawing on the power of a split and pool because our system is reconfigurable by DNA. So what we want to do is to work with our uh, snakes on the top immobilized on beads, and then we split these beads into se the several pools. And in each pool, we add one instruction strand. So we say, for example, bend joint one, bend joint two, and bend joint three. And then they do different things. And then we just pool them all. And then we split them again. So we get a mixture in, in, in pool two here in the bottom of what has gone through the, the first uh, steps here. And then we apply step two. And what's important here is that we do, we have many copies of the same snake on each bead and every snake on, on, on one bead gets exactly the same instructions, which means that we end up with a lot of copies of the same type of protein on each bead. And additionally, because we control these things by DNA, we imagine ligating on the DNA strands to the beads to create like kind of a, uh, a molecular record of what happened with these uh, beads. So then we imagine taking the beads uh, and putting them in oil emulsion droplets. So one bead in each drop, and then assaying the function somehow. And then we take the best drop, pick it out, and sequence the DNA to, to get a record of what happened to that bead. So assaying function could, for example, be which particle arrangement of proteins elicits the strongest, strongest reply from T cells or strongest binding to, uh, to, un to surface of the virus, for example by basically having some evolution procedure on the snake level. In terms of what we would get, we don't even need fully 5,000. <laughs> I'll, I'll do the simulations for 42 cents, and Car Carlos, <coughs> Carlos can do two or three designs for which we can come up with some basic DNA origami design and try to design how to move exactly to certain angle the, the snake and hold it at that shape, do TM imaging to really verify the ang angles are set. And that would get us started. Thank you. Hello. Questions, comments first? Uh, yeah, we have one over here. And then. I think in terms of the application, I mean, this is really fascinating because it reminds me of, um, I mean, th this is some sort of a generalized space filling network where you still have control over local geometry, right? And you still have a lot of high degree of porosity. So, you know, think about like all the applications of metal organic frameworks and MOFs. This is sort of like a generalized version of MOFs where you can control proximity between enzymatic proteins. And you can imagine a lot of uh, chemical synthesis applications based on that. Perhaps even things that are reconfigurable. So I, I think that's, that's actually a very, very neat concept. That's a great point, thank you. Also, what's pretty cool about this approach is that you can break the symmetry. So often you can make three assemblies of like components, stuff, enzymes, and such. But uh, but uh, but to to do like things that are useful, for example, like carboxysome-like things, you need like to break the symmetry in some way. And like 
have different ratios of different catalytic. Yeah, I'm not sure I, I appreciate the flexibility of the origami backbone. First of all, it's in a, it seems like a, a very expensive way of building these macromolecular complexes, but not quite sure I understand you know, the rationale for this positioning unless you're trying to bring two proteins together. I mean, again, we, we struggled with how do you assemble two proteins to form a higher order structure, and we think that should be innate to the proteins, and so possibly you don't need this ultra-precision folding uh, of, of the origami DNA. Also, I think, I mean, it, has it been demons? Um, it's possible to click proteins to DNA, but how do you unclick them? I mean, that, that could be done with cleavable DNA strands or, or strand displacement or something like that if you don't mind having potentially some fragment of DNA on the complex. And, and the command where you want to position the protein separately, so it's still very difficult to engineer like 600 orthogonal domains that you would just throw the proteins in and they would assemble each into their specific position. But with this approach, you keep the proteins separately and they don't interact until you bring them into proximity. So you can do this with just one interface. Yeah, we agree that throwing 600 things together and uh, uh, getting flawless self-assembly isn't going to work, but the question whether you need this precise control. OK. Maybe the last one from Brenda over there. One's a quick comment and one's a, a, a question. So, so first as a comment, is I, I sort of view this as, as synthetic enzymes. So enzymes bring the pieces together sequentially in, in different ways. And so um, I think it's an interesting version of that. Um, but the, the other comment is uh, the, the assembly piece is something I was thinking about last night. So um, how would you guarantee that even if you brought these proteins together, that they would self-assemble in the ways that, that you want? Um, you know, now you're working in an uncrowded environment. There are a lot of variables that you need to control. Um, so some of the physics is changing there. The entropy is changing than, let's say, if you just worked in, in a vacuum. And, and so some of these things have to be worked out, most likely. I mean, the assembly would be done in buffer in vitro, right? You would first manufacture them, and then once the protein is assembled, we, want, we can cleave off the DNA strands, if necessary, and then use it in vivo application, for example. No, but what I mean is in this structure, now you're confining the proteins into a specific geometry, which means that now you're changing the entropy that's going on in the system. So it's, you know, it's different than if you simulated it on its own. Well, I mean, you can run the simulation, hold them at the position with the given flexibility, and check you know, whether the interface be designed and the distance at which they are positioned within fluctuations for given temperature would be enough to bring them. And in silico modeling can help a lot with these designs. Okay, thank you so much. Wonderful. Thank you.